That's very accidental. And we've moved from being very uh, accidental with our approach here in Croatia, especially in terms of digital nomads, to being more purposeful, you know, and doing everything we do for a reason and trying to direct that. So all of the stuff that you saw about the digital nomad uh, visa and the way it's done, and then also Tanya's events, is to keep Croatia relevant, present in people's minds. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Um, this is the first of hopefully a special series looking into Croatia's foray into the digital nomad space and the brilliant people behind it that's making it happen. Um, for podcast listeners, this will be a special episode that will be slotted in between the regular Chat with Nomads interviews. So today we have two amazing community builders, Michael, from, who is the director of Digital Nomad Association, DNA Croatia, and Tanya, who is the co-founder of the association and also the founder of Saltwater Nomads. Welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Thanks for having us on. Thanks, yeah, Ray. Thanks. Lovely to be here. Thanks for taking time out. So let's start with an introduction about yourself and basically what DNA and saltwater nomads do. Tanya, you can go first. Oh, well, thank you, Michael. That is very gentlemanly of you. Uh, so, well, saltwater came first, so I'll discuss that a, a little and then talk about DNA, the Digital Nomad Association Croatia. So I, as my accent always betrays me, I'm originally Australian born and bred uh, with a family connection to Croatia. So I started a small co-work space back in 2017 in Split on the Dalmatian coast. And it was ticking along until the pandemic kicked in and everyone started to work from home or remotely. So uh, the small segment that was available to us for digital nomads really has just, you know, exploded as we all know and while we're here I guess and listening and so since then and from that experience and also having collaborated quite a lot with Michael who you'll shortly hear from who's also uh, very close to Split uh, we have you know been working with different destinations around Croatia to you know make this more than just the co-work space in salt water but uh, major events so in Dubrovnik in Zagreb and and other projects so uh, a few other cities and possibly islands involved uh, so that's the salt water story uh did you know that association Croatia so what was happening last year obviously Jan de Jong uh, is a new local, I would say, a Dutch guy who really saw the potential in what digital nomads could bring to Croatia. So he really championed, uh, you know, this uh, more of the legislative change, which we now have of the visa or permit, which is what it really is, uh, in place. And so with it all, you know, with when you have an individual uh, approaching governments or locations, there's not as much power as, you know, a body. So the Digital Nomad Association was formed uh, and I'll hand over to Michael on that one to tell you about the Digital Nomad Association Croatia. Excellent. Cool. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah, so before I get into DNA Croatia, just a bit of my background. As Tanya said, we've worked together quite closely. Um, I moved to Croatia in 2015 and uh, immediately became the uh, runner, the running person i guess the i'll call it a runner because it sounds like i'm running around uh, at amosfera co-working in split and because of that i met tanya with all the saltwater uh, workspaces and co-working spaces that she runs and we did quite a few events together um working exactly as she said like working hard and then covid came along and that was yeah then it was like pivoting with that uh, that's part of what I do. The other part of the stuff I do is work, working a lot with startups, uh, especially social enterprise startups. Um, so then the DNA story came about. Um, so they've been set up just a year ago now, December 2020, it was uh, opened. Uh, so a year into the story. And yeah, there's Jan, Tanya and Carmela who founded this nonprofit organization, uh, whose main goal is to develop Croatia and develop the community of digital nomads in Croatia. Um, there was in the beginning a lot of stuff around, yeah, getting digital nomads here, setting up this digital nomad uh, visa slash permit, whatever you want to call it, um, and making it easy for them to come here. And we've almost, we're, we're, we're on a good, we're on a good path there. We've definitely got the legislation through. We're one of the first countries um, offering a digital nomad uh, visa. 
Uh, and now it's looking at how we can improve that, which is one of our goals um, actually this month is to reflect, uh, meet with the powers that be and look at how we can improve that next year um, to make it easier to apply for ultimately. Um, and then the other side of digital nomad, uh, there's a few, there's five main priority areas. Um, but the, the, the main area we're looking at now is the community. Getting everyone in Croatia who wants to work in the digital nomad story, working together to promote Croatia. Um, we see on Nomad List that actually we uh, have three locations on Nomad List that appear in a few charts, like upcoming co-working spaces or rapidly growing, uh, sorry, not co-working spaces, um, like digital nomad communities, um, uh, up and coming ones, rapidly growing ones. And so at the moment, we, we actually boast uh, split Zagreb and Zadar in there which is interesting because Portugal only have two, the UK only has two. Um, the people that are beating us are like Thailand um, and Germany, you know, places that have been digital nomad destination or a well-known dis digital nomad destination or startup destination for a bit longer. So we're looking at how can we turn Croatia into a digital nomad destination, which means people will come here at the moment for up to a year and they can move around and explore the whole of Croatia. Because Rex, I know that you've been, you know, you've been in a couple of locations now, and you can definitely say the differences between these locations. Um, and if you're staying, for example, in six places, two months each, there's enough to do um, for at least a year, if not more. Um, I think you have different types of digital nomads as well. Some of them want to be in one place for six months. You know, they really want to get involved locally, be part of the community, maybe learn the language, uh, explore beyond, say, if you're only in a place for two months, and other people want to move around every month. So it's about looking at how we can shape Croatia to that with our community within Croatia. And then reaching out to um, the community, the second community, which is Digital Nomads here, kind of talking to them, sharing all of this information with them, educating them about Croatia, um, and getting them exploring. Uh, and I guess part of this is also with the events Tanya talks about, you know, to really showcase what Croatia has to offer. Um, there are very similar themes around Croatia. Uh, first of all, the food is amazing everywhere. It's all local, it's all organic. And there's a range because Croatia is a, like a, a mishmash of different cultures. You know, you've got the Italian influence on the coast. You've got the, say, Turkish influence from the north, uh, sorry, from the south. And then in the north, you have like Hungarian influence as well as Croatians' own dishes, yeah? So that's one thing. Then you've got safety. Croatia is a very, very safe place. So, you know, sharing this with people because unless you've been to Croatia, people might not know how safe it is. Um, knowing where Croatia is on the map is another story. And then finally, the other thing is community. Like, I'm sure you've met a few, quite a lot of great people here and having that community that you can like literally drop into. Uh, and I'm not just talking about digital nomads, but I'm talking about locals as well. And that's one thing. Uh, Tanya and I in Split have, um, you know, worked hard on developing um, and having the right people where, you know, if you said to me, hey, where do I have, um, where do I eat this meal? We can tell you. Um, how do I find somebody that raises goats? I want to milk some goats and make some cheese. We can tell you. Uh, where do I find um, a singing class? We can tell you. That's, that's kind of what we, we're looking to do. Right, right. There's a lot of interesting points that you mentioned that I would like to talk about, but I can't resist the urge to jump a bit into the personal aspect of it, whereby both of you are obviously not initially from Croatia, right? And something definitely attracted you guys to stay here, right? So maybe in short, what's, what's the thing that really got you guys started to think about staying and of course developing, even going to a further step to develop a community here? Um, I think there are three groups of people that move here. Um, Tanya and I represent two of those groups. The third group that I'll just mention are people that get married to Croatians. Um, <laughs> that's the third group. Uh, my group is the kind of random people here with no connection to, low, uh, to Croatia. I moved here mainly for the climate, the food, the Mediterranean lifestyle. Um, that's it, the outdoors, the outdoors life. Here you spend most of your time outdoors, um, drinking coffee, going for hikes, swimming, um, on a boat, whatever. It's, a li it's an outdoor lifestyle. So that's what brought me here. Uh, so mine is a family heritage connection. Uh, both my parents moved from Croatia to Australia and I have citizenship, so it's certainly easier. Uh, and I would try, uh, agree and say the lifestyle here, 
and cost of living uh, in comparison to uh, the rising costs in Australia. Um, my main motivation, though, was not being locked to a mortgage for the next, you know, three decades in Australia and, you know, having kind of a simpler life and, you know, walkability in a city. Um, yeah, so that's me. Nice. Um, let's go back to the big topic of our, I think, and I, and I think I spoke to Michael about this before the first time we met. Um, I was saying like in different countries, like you mentioned, there's a specific city or two cities that are being promoted um, aggressively as digital nomad destinations, right? And the first thing that I saw was really unique or ambitious here is that you guys are trying to push the whole of Croatia as like a whole destination whereby you can spend a month or two months in each individual cities. And I think it's interesting to hear from both of you because the way I see it, I'm not sure if I'm correct, but DNA looks at the overview picture of like uh, policies or infrastructure that can cater to the whole, uh, the whole country in different cities. Whereas saltwater dives a bit deeper into each city to develop initiative and infrastructure specific to what the local government wants, right? So how do you guys balance this? And, and do you think it's a very ambitious project to go straight into looking at pushing Croatia as a whole rather than only focusing on very specific cities? Uh, I might start this time. Uh, I, it's a really interesting question and it's, and, and it's a very accurate observation. Uh, hmm, I, I think in terms of people who have left, so the brain drain uh, in particular, that's certainly of interest to many parts of Croatia because, you know, I mean, Michael can maybe speak more about a place like Osijek, which, you know, does a lot of work, uh, exports its, you know, uh, products by pressing send. So I think that there are certainly opportunities around the country um, and that's a, a good reason. Uh, oh, but in terms of I mean, I can't pick a favourite place in Croatia, you know, and right now I'm up in Zagreb, so it's the continental climate, whereas I'm based down the coast, so it's Mediterranean. You know, then you've got islands. So for me, I'm, I get the best of all worlds by being able to work with multiple places. Uh, and they're so close to each other. So, you know, two weeks in Dubrovnik, followed by two on the island of Korčula, you know, it's just so easy to get around. Um, yeah, I, I think... I think it is ambitious, but it's ambitious for a reason. One of the reasons is I'm, I'm quite a big, I've traveled a lot in my life, not so much since I moved to Croatia, funnily enough, because obviously I like it here so much. Um, but one of the things is um, having, you know, those real authentic experiences in these places and authentic experiences get, gets overused. But what I mean by that is we see, especially in Europe, that more and more cities are becoming homogenized. You could possibly drop people into, into different cities and they wouldn't really know where they were. Yeah, they'd see, they'd see certain brands, they'd see people wearing certain clothes, that kind of stuff. Now, the reason we want to promote the whole of Croatia and different cities within Croatia is because they are very unique. But they're only unique once, you, you know, once you've been there as, a say, a bit longer. If you go there for three days, you'll do very, very similar things in each city, right? That's what a city is like. That's, that's the fact. You know, you have museums, you have galleries, you have X, Y, and Z. But when you get into these places, that's where you really see a bit more about the culture and the people and, and the food. And, and Croatia is very unique in that way. As I was explaining about the different influences earlier, the Dalmatian lifestyle that Tanya and I are used to is very different to, say, the Slavonian lifestyle in Osijek. Um, and then you've got Zagreb as well, which is the, one of the most international cities in Croatia, um, where you can go for Venezuelan food. Whereas actually, if you pop over to, I don't know, if you pop over to um, Paula, maybe because there isn't that international vibe, you're only going to have food that's either Croatian or Italian influenced, for example. So it is ambitious, but that's because we truly believe that each, each person, each digital nomad has something that's special to them. And we've got to show them, okay, Croatia has, you know, something special to you. Some people really love Zagreb and don't like Split. Some people love Split and don't really want to go to Zagreb. And now we're going to share that with uh, all the other places you can visit in Croatia. Right. I might, yeah, I might on. add, yeah. sorry to interrupt, Rex, but I might add no. one other thing, uh, particularly what we're seeing, especially with the pandemic, you know, the difficulty in traveling to the Asian hotspots, say. Uh, it's kind of like a nomad trail is what I've been calling it. So you might, you know, land in Zagreb, 
you know, meander through the country, head down to Montenegro, ultimately Albania. So you are getting to explore along the way and the diversity of the climate and the landscapes, I think also are why, you know, it's it, it's a way that you could really plonk anywhere, but also to do with the nomadic lifestyle. Right, that, that's very interesting because I think this was one of the main thing that I got a better look at. I mean, it all sounds logical, but it just wasn't a thought process that when I look at, or I will say even a lot of nomads that look at Croatia as a destination, we do not really see it as individual cities. You know, we'll see that, okay, Croatia is pushing this initiative this way. It's as a, when we view it, it's a whole country. But of course, when I came down here and look at it, I realized there are different stakeholders in different cities trying to push different initiatives. And one of the more specific stuff is we are looking at is that different local governments actually have different problems and they see digital nomads as a solution to certain problems that might not necessarily be the same. Like you guys were saying by the coast, it was very much a problem of seasonal tourism, right? Where, where in summer, there's a lot of tourists, but in winter, not just tourism dies down, even the local life dies down because the people are so tired from serving customers in the summer that even in the winter, they just want to sleep at home and, and not do much, right? And that's the coast. And then if you look at places like Zagreb, which is probably way more all season or all rounded year round, they have different ideas on what they want uh, this particular group to really address. And I think this is not something that has been thought about a lot because as traveling nomads, it's, it's kind of not our problem, you know what I mean? Like we are just keen on finding where we can go. But when we think about it, there are certain reasons why policies are coming out to cater to this, this travelers group because they can help to alleviate certain problems. So when you guys address, because um, Michael, I know you have been traveling around different cities as well uh, in recent months to visit the different councils and stuff. How difficult or easy is it to really put all the problems and solve it as one versus does it really need to be segmented a lot across different cities? What's your vibe on that? Um, yeah, well, first of all, I, you know, I actually got asked today, I'm in Bielovard at the moment. So if any of you who's listening knows where Bielovard is, um, without looking on a map, and you're not Croatian or Croatian heritage, then next time you come to Split, call me and I'll buy you a beer, because not many people know where Bielovard is. And I said, I, I was very honest, just look, um, these problems that you're talking about, Rex, they cannot be solved in one way. Yeah, you cannot solve anything with digital nomads or having, you know, digital nomadism in your place. There's different layers to that. So it's actually like, OK, well, what are the benefits that digital nomads bring? And as with everything, there's different uh, pieces of the puzzle that you need to bring together, which, you know, digital nomads is a piece of that puzzle. Um, so, yeah, I, I never really see uh, I, I don't see it as solving a problem, but I can see digital nomads contributing to certain things that are all around Croatia, like. Uh, one example is, okay, the tech sector here is, is getting better and better. It's, it's quite well developed. And within the tech sector, you can see, say, 50 different job titles in Croatia. But when it comes to marketing, you probably only see like five different job titles. You know, there's not like a Pinterest specialist in Croatia, so to speak. There might be, maybe I don't know where they are. But in most organizations, they're not big enough to have that. But that is actually, that is a job position. We know that exists. We know remote workers that do that. We know freelancers that do that. So actually with digital nomads sharing, hey, this is what I do and this is how I got into it with say students, either high school students or university students, just to, just to show you know, what else is out there. That's, that's one of the things we see as being a potential of showing younger people in Croatia that these jobs exist, that you can do them remotely. So, hey, why not stay in what, what many people tell me is the best country in the world or the best city in the world where they live and work from there and work doing the job you want to do but just not for a company necessarily that's on your doorstep. So that's that's kind of the reverse side of digital nomads, I guess. And that that applies uh, that you know Tanya spoke about Osijek. Um, that applies to to many parts of Croatia where they've seen the a population decrease. Right. And Tanya, do you have any um, insights on this part? Because you obviously ran different initiative for Zagreb with the Zagreb Ambassador Program, Dubrovnik with the DIR and the conferences. And of course, you are running a lot of initiative in Split because that's your home base. How easy is it, is it to cater to different governments or is there a real need for customization to different places? 
Yeah, I mean, there are certainly some approaches you can take that are quite universal, you know, like for, I think a really good example would be a co-work space. I mean, it's so key to a lot of these things. So if you're a destination that doesn't even have one, you know, that's that's something that you need to do. So something like that is, say, I would say a universal one. Uh, and then, yeah, definitely it, it's about tailoring it. So, um, you know, the coast, you mentioned seasonality, which is our biggest issue and something that DNA is uh, addressing through accommodation. Uh, so, you know, it's very difficult to find long stay uh, in peak season uh, and to some degree even in winter because people weren't listing. I think something that we haven't mentioned in this chat, though, is that digital nomad as a term is now mainstream in this country, whereas, you know, the month before the pandemic, my family didn't know what I was doing. Like to have to explain, yeah, people come here and pay to rent a desk. It's like, huh, are they crazy? <laughs> uh, so I just didn't even bother explaining that. Whereas now there's a, a grandmother in the building that I'm in who has three French digital nomads. And so like I've heard, overheard her say, oh, I have three digital, a digital nomadi here. So that, and that's across the country. So everyone knows what a digital nomad is. So um, which I think as a hospi hospitable people anyway, now when they see the person on the computer in a cafe, it's not like, oh, you're taking up space and, you know, business here. It's like, oh, you're a digital nomad. And so I think that obviously, you know, smaller towns, whether it's Croatia or Australia, England, wherever you go, you know, you really have to have stuff to offer. And so uh, in our project in Dubrovnik, the Digital Nomads in Residence, I specifically found a placemaking strategist. And so what that means is, you know, maybe you want to re revitalize an area of your city that has, you know, give like free rent or, you know, subsidize rent for, for initiatives. So there are certainly ways. So it's kind of, you know, it's a blend of urban planning as well, you know, and working with citizens and, and co-creation. So, I, you know, I, I don't know that all places would be successful or maybe there's a particular time of year when the focus should be on that but um you know I, I did mention sorry I didn't finish that thought on people the brain drain returning so if you've been living in Dublin for the last eight years and you come yes I know you're not a digital nomad you're a returning you know member of the emigre however your colleagues you know other people in your organization may now consider that location through your connection and so I think that's what's um the potential here and you know, Croatia is so small and like if you follow any of our football, you know, like we do everything with heart and, and just, you know, to, to a high level. So I, I compare it to that where, you know, we make an impact, like we, we're going for the World Cup on this one for sure. Yeah, nice, nice. I definitely like to touch a bit more on the pandemic shift, right? Because um, I would love to hear your perspective of how it happened because from our perspective, from someone from outside, just looking at the world's landscape, Croatia was never that prominent a spot for digital nomad. It was never a nomad hub or anything. Um, I think there's interest in it because I think a lot of people know that this is one country where people used to escape the whole Schengen 90, 90 days to 180 days visa limitations, right? So you go to the Balkans and Croatia is just at the border, right? And the infrastructure here is, is considerably good. Uh, if you look at the whole of Eastern Europe, I think Croatia has, has quite well developed infrastructure. So would you really say that Croatia really came onto the map um, one plus year ago? And, and for me, I really saw it come up because of the digital nomad visa. I think Croatia was not the first to launch, launch it, but it was one of the first to announce that there's plans of it. And there was a lot of hype within, and you can see in like nomad Facebook groups that there's a lot of hype about this thing. Right, And one of the things that I think Croatia did very well is that there's a lot of press and information work done in pushing this thing out, which is what got Croatia on the map based on my perspective of it. But for you guys who are already here before the pandemic even happened, trying to make things move in this aspect, uh, was it the same feeling? Um, I'll, I'll start just um, to touch on the Schengen thing. Um, so yeah, the Schengen shuffle, yeah, escaping uh, most of the EU to come to Croatia for three months so that you can go back into the EU. That was the, the Schengen shuffle. Um, that's very accidental, right? 
Croatia didn't think, oh, we'll stay out of the Schengen zone for, you know, if you, and now it's been delayed again, right? So people can still do the Schengen shuffle. That's very accidental. And we've moved from being very uh, accidental with our approach here in Croatia, especially in terms of digital nomads, to being more purposeful, you know, and doing everything we do for a reason and trying to direct that. So all of the stuff that you saw about the digital nomad uh, visa and the way it's done, and then also Tanya's events, is to keep Croatia relevant, present in people's minds. Uh, Tanya, I, like I'm sure you can add to, to that. Yeah, so it wasn't just the permit, I would say. Croatia was actually one of the, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, the only EU country open to foreign nationals during the pandemic. So, you know, American citizens or, you know, people who were in, um, uh, what do you call it when, like, the not mixed race, but like different, um, you know, if you've, you're a Turkish citizen, you're a German citizen, like they couldn't meet in their home countries, but Croatia was this neutral ground. So there was a lot of uh, romantic reunions here for one. Um, and so people who had never considered Croatia discovered it also, I guess, like Michael was saying, by accident because it was the only place open. So there was a number of those factors. And certainly, so Dubrovnik is quite world famous. Uh, they held a, uh, well, we organised a, a conference there last October because there was all this hype about it because the uh, permit was announced in July or August. Uh, Michael was the uh, esteemed MC at that event, which is probably why it was so successful. But, you know, that then got a, um, a mention in the Washington Post, uh, you know, a couple of months later. So it certainly started to be seen in a lot of, like, large publications uh, and that awareness it was like about okay let's do something else to keep keep the spotlight on here because we've got something good happening and people really interested in positive uh, reviews and the locals really engaging in it so it was just a, a mi the right mix of time and circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay and looking at it looking at how it has developed right and I'm sure you guys are seeing more and more projects of interest even from surrounding countries. Um, I want to look back inside this country, right? What's What do you guys think are the biggest challenge in building a community within Croatia? Because both of you are actually pretty good at it, but it's definitely difficult to really maintain a community as a whole. Um, where do you see the challenge exactly? Is it like a time period thing whereby people are still living during the winter? or are there other factors in play? Um, I moved to Split in October. When I got there, everyone told me nothing happens in Split on October. And luckily I was pleasant, pleasantly surprised that a lot does happen in the winter in Split. And this was six years ago. Now, one of the reasons there's a lot of stuff happening is because first of all, there's you know 200,000 people there, but also because there's quite a vibrant um, foreign community there already. Yeah, a lot of people, as we mentioned before, those three groups, diaspora, people returning or, or going back to their roots, people married to Croatians. And I was really a weirdo for being in Croatia with no connections. That's completely changed now in split. You have probably as, as many uh, people, diaspora, diaspora, people returning Croatian roots as people with no Croatian roots now. Um, now, in terms of creating a community, you need people that are there year round, yeah? You need those people that uh, when someone new arrives, they know who that person is and they'll hang out with them and they'll get taken to their weekend house and have lunch there on a Sunday with them and they'll find the nicest walking routes nearby. And I guess it's, it's, there's, there's people like that in every place in the world. So it's just finding those people, uh, which is why I've been traveling around to these places and, and saying like, this is, when I moved to Croatia, this is what I wanted. I'm not a digital nomad as such. Um, I'm not nomadic anymore, for sure. I'm I'm here in Croatia, um, but that's that's the connection that a lot of them want to find when we when we speak to you know the majority of nomads that come to Croatia anyway. Um, for me, that will be you know the the trickiest part of creating the community is having those people present and available um, whenever someone arrives, and then connecting them. Yeah, I uh, I'll answer this with uh, funding would be the biggest challenge. That's my answer. So, you know, there's lots of places that, you know, want to create an atmosphere that nomads will come to, like small town mayors, for example. Hey, we want to do something. 
and you know they they really have a great location and things like that but they just don't have a lot of budget um not only because of COVID so you know coffers not getting as full from you know the reduced period of tourism uh, there was a high number of tourists but like it was a shorter season so you know and if you want to get something out there you need to lift the standard and that and that costs money you know so I you know we have done the events we've done as cheap as possible to, to but to get them to like a level that gets global attention so you know there's only so many favors you can ask because a lot of the people that have been involved in a lot of these things are you know experts in their field and um, you're probably familiar with local wages here so these are people who also work remotely uh, they're, they're expecting a higher you know fee and if you want to get the good presenters in uh, so there's a couple of more than a couple of events planned for 2022 and you know speakers that you want from different countries are not cheap and so unfortunately I think that that's going to be at least for me with some of these events so uh, yeah there'll be a real push for sponsorships or some kind of you know you know communicating to someone who's from the US who maybe commands five or ten k it's like hey this just isn't the budget that we have um but your support is necessary so yeah a lot of um you know <laughs> uh charming <laughs> people to to come and join our future events is at least for me a, a challenge ahead Okay, I, I like that we are starting to tie in the picture of like, in order to build a nomadic community or in order to build a city or a country into an attractive place for remote workers is not a single person or single entity job, right? Michael was talking a lot about local experience. And from there, we, we're not just talking about community, we could also be talking about how tourism can change to cater to very localized experiences versus just the typical highlights, right? And you were talking a lot about government, which, which is where I'm going to throw like a difficult bone here, right? Because I would assume as with every place, bureaucracy is the hardest thing to deal with when you run this kind of stuff, right? Um, and where do you find it to be the most challenging when it comes to dealing with governmental bodies and bureaucracy? Apart from funding, obviously, I think it's a concern for even private companies. But how do you convince, you know, CDs that, hey, this is the right step to take. Shall I start this one, Michael? Sure, go for it. Okay. Uh, so obviously there's the national level and maybe Michael can speak more to this. So one of DNA's five areas is representation. So bringing issues, uh, for example, extending the permit for more than a year, that'll be something, you know, we're hearing that from digital nomads who are looking to apply. So we'll convey that uh I'll let Michael answer that one because he's that's his that's his job. Uh, in terms of local government, though, and I speak from the experience that I've had with you know these destinations, uh, that's interesting. So, you know, and, and you know, you throw in the bone, I'm picking it up. Um, you know, there is a uh, reputation of corruption, it's particularly in smaller places. So, you know, if you're not a member of the elected party. You know your your project project is not necessarily going to be approved. <clears throat> I do think that there's a there's been a huge change in that, and a lot of places are a lot more transparent. Um, you know, not only with their budgets, but you know, if it's an EU funded thing, like there's a lot of hoops you need to jump through for that to happen. So, I think because this is such a new thing, like it has been a lot easier to get these things approved. Um, but again, I think it just comes down to the personnel in a place, like on how willing they are or not. And I mean, I'm from a government town, I'm from Canberra, so I've been on both sides. So I know what it can be like, like anywhere, Croatia or not, of getting things approved. Uh, so, you know, one tip would be if you are looking to do something in Croatia, you know, budgets are done at a certain time of year for the year ahead. So, you know, you don't come a month before and then expect it. And then if you get turned away and say, oh, they're not here to help me, it's like, well, you know, there is a process still. So it, it, it's that awareness. So um, a lot better than it's been. And I think it's going to get better, but, um, and particularly because it is of national interest, uh, cities and localities and counties are, are keen to support this. So mm, hopefully they will even more, Michael. 
Yeah, um, just to, to pick up what Tanya was saying when she threw it over to me, so representation. So we, yeah, we talked to um, top level uh, ministers in developing the, the, the nomad digital nomad visa here in Croatia. Um, that's how it got into uh, the law in the beginning and we need to have that constant dialogue with them um, and sharing exactly what digital nomads are saying. So, you, you know, being the intermediary between the um, ground level to say the, the government level. Um, and that all comes down to buy-in, yeah, political buy-in. And I don't mean political buy-in just from that public sector, but actually that relationship between the public, the third, the charity sector and the private sector, how well they can work together how well they can focus on a common goal, a common objective, put together any beef from the past, yeah, any issues from the past that they might have, you know, maybe someone's uncle stole their other uncle's land or something. I don't know. There's, there's sometimes small things like this that stop people working together. But ultimately, we are working for a common goal. We are looking at putting Croatia on the map for many reasons. And we're looking at not only attracting people here, but trying to get people to stay in Croatia and not feel like they have to move elsewhere because the grass is greener. Um, I've been in many places um, and the grass is pretty green here in Croatia, uh, obviously, depending what you're after. Um, so, yeah, buy in from all parties. That's that's the biggest challenge. Um, bureaucracy. If there's buy in, there is no bureaucracy. People make things happen. Tanya mentioned budgets. There's there's so many different budgets available that you can always find something for promotion of your town. You can always find something for a speaker. But if there's no will to do that, they won't find the budget. They'll say, oh, well, the budget's drawn up in November or December. Ideally, as Tanya said, you'll go. You'd go at the end of the year or, you know, you'll be working throughout the year and say, look, at the end of this year, please put in X amount so we can do more stuff for digital nomads. That's the dream. But, you know, we're, we're in a country, um, especially Dalmatia, which is very... Um, like for an, for someone from London, it's last minute, but for someone in Dalmatia, it's normal. Yeah, you you plan a meeting two days beforehand, you plan an event maybe two weeks beforehand, or you don't send out invites to the event event until two weeks before. Whereas I know what I'm doing in June next year, you know, um, and that's one of the reasons I love Dalmatia so much because it is a lot more spontaneous and relaxed. Um, so yeah, definitely, I think when we think about bureaucracy, I think bureaucracy can be solved, but there has to be political buy-in. And yeah, people have to be kind of snappy and, and innovative in, in how they make things happen. I have raised my hand, I'll now lower my hand. Uh, uh, I also want to mirror Michael's uh, comment earlier, like the support from the city and the government is essential, like essential, essential, essential. And, and so you have city support, the digital nomad community and the local community working together. Without that, like, you will fail like I in fact when someone does come you know to me with a, an idea that's the first thing I ask to see okay where is that level of buy-in at because otherwise you're wasting a lot of time and energy uh, for everyone um and so there's that but the other thing I've seen which is really encouraging is locations wanting to work together uh Dubrovnik and Zagreb is a really good example uh and then you know on for example, a particular island that I'm hoping to get a project with, you know, different parts of that island are coming together. So that's like two very different minded, um, you know, councils and sets of decision makers who will work together for like a greater benefit. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that happening. And that is certainly what we're looking to encourage with DNA, uh, more of that. Right. I, I found that the balance between competition and collaboration being very interesting because obviously you're looking at cities and each of them wants to try and draw in like the, the remote workers to their side, right? Because that's where the so got the money and whatever is, right? So, but when you want to push Croatia as a whole big destination, I, I guess this is where DNA really comes in, in, in being able to pair up or even be the middleman that's able to hook up certain initiative that could potentially be beneficial to two or more cities uh, at, a, at one time, right? Um, I definitely do want to touch on one more thing before we close off, because I think this will be very interesting for a lot of people, including me when I came on. We mentioned Dubrovnik a lot of times <laughs> throughout this chat, and I don't think Dubrovnik was ever mentioned or thought of as a nomad destination, right? It was always a tourist hotspot because of Game of Thrones, because of the amazing nature, because of the coast, right? And I guess people do know that Dubrovnik isn't exactly the cheapest city to be in, even within Croatia, right? 
So I was very pleasantly surprised when I heard that, you know, Dubrovnik is not just active and enthusiastic about pushing this initiative, but the, the, the conference last year and the Digital Nomad in Residence program has actually been pretty well recognized um, on the international scene, right? So it was a very successful case study for a lot of other Balkan countries. And I think this is why countries like Montenegro and stuff are starting to look to Croatia as an example to develop their own digital nomad policies and programs, right? So from that angle, what can other countries or other cities learn from in terms of like even turning a location that wasn't expected to be a digital nomad destination to be something of a successful case study? Um, on behalf of DNA Croatia, no country will have the same offer as Croatia has for digital nomads. Um, no, no, in all, in all honesty, uh, Dubrovnik's a great story, actually. Um, Tanya can explain a bit more. Um, but it was that it came around, came about from before COVID, actually, with this, this uh, the COVID pushed it towards this new normal. So what is the new normal of Dubrovnik and Dubrovnik tourism? Um, and, and yeah, actually, when it comes to, because I'll let Tanya talk about that, because I think it's quite a nice story. And Tanya was very much involved in that. And there's a lot more to say about that, especially from the digital nomads. Uh, but in terms of other countries, I think, you know, benchmarking, you always just benchmark what works in other places, but then you still need to apply what makes you unique about that, right? Um, and there are, you know, digital nomads, it's, it's not, it's, there's not one person who's a digital nomad. You can go on nomad list and it's this 32 year old white heterosexual male from the US, but that isn't every digital nomad. Like, you know, there are some of those, but when I think about in Split, actually there's a lot of females in Split and they are all very unique, different ages, different backgrounds, all of that stuff. Um, so every place has something to offer. Um, so I think it's really looking at what they have to offer and then making sure people know that um, and then offering that, you know, offering that and making it very clear that this is who we are, this is what we have, and this is why as a digital nomad, you'll love it here for one month, two months, three months, whatever it is. I'll let Tanya talk about the problem. Yeah, great points. Uh, I think the interesting thing about Dubrovnik and other cities like Dubrovnik, so let's use Venice as an example, um, you know, really over-touristed and the pandemic was this opportunity to rewrite, okay, well, what do you want tourism to look like? And so that certainly informed their decision in, okay, how do we create a more sustainable offer? And, uh, you know, I re read a really good piece about Venice in the New York Times before this event, it was last June. And, you know, a I think it was a study they had done, you know, someone who's there for somewhere for a month isn't like racing around on the water taxis and then cramming spaces if they're only there for one to three days. So that longer stay or the slow travel like is much more beneficial to a city uh, that has a problem with it. And, you know, other cities, I'll say split, it's coming there. Like it's this summer, it was so packed in. Um, you know, these cities need to look at ways to, to manage this. Uh, there's a country, I can't remember where it is, you know, they charge a huge fee to just to get in to manage this issue. So you're getting a more quality um, experience for everyone. And so I think that cities, you know, they don't need to replicate what Dubrovnik or someone did. The other thing about a sort of, you know, an anchor city or anchor tenant type scenario of Dubr Dubrovnik is as Michael said, people haven't heard of Bielovar. People haven't even heard of Zadar, which is where you are, Rax. And there's, you know, heaps of budget flights into Zadar. And so when you get them to experience one part of it, then they can ultimately discover Bielovar. They're never going to discover Bielovar on their own. And so these larger locations, I would absolutely use its, you know, existing reputation and then all the others get help because, you know, you're not coming just for, you know, a couple of days. You're going to explore uh, other parts. Um, other than that, yeah, look at examples around the world and perhaps how that might apply to your city. Uh, get in touch with us as DNA. We are certainly uh, uh, open to sharing our, our knowledge and holding a lot more information sessions next year and, and working together like collaboration. Like that's, um, you know, a community doesn't stay in one place. They're moving around. And so... Uh, I think that's one of the greatest takeaways I had this year from one of the nomads who came uh, from Barcelona and he said his whole thing was about, um, you know, not focusing on a destination, focusing on the community. So it's that nice balance. So if you don't have an existing community in your destination, 
bring the community to you and reward them in some way. It can be done. I think, and I think Barn Score to me is one of the greatest examples of that currently that we have. Just to um, jump onto what Tanya said there about split, actually, one of the things when I'm going around Croatia talking about uh, digital nomads, and they're like, yeah, but you know, split, Dubrovnik, all of this. But as Tanya said, in June, July, and August, you don't want to be in those places. Uh, for me, like May and October is when I try and get all my friends and family to come to Split um, for two reasons. One is there's direct flights and two, because it's chilled, the weather's still good and you can go swimming and you can do everything you want to do. Uh, food's always good you know, all year round. So actually, one of the reasons of promoting Croatia all year round is because maybe you'll be in Split in October, November. December, you've got Advent in Zagreb and January, you can go skiing in Zagreb as well if that's something you're into. February, maybe you'll swing back down south where it's a bit warmer, you know, to escape, uh, especially in March. It, it, there's, a, there's a wind that people don't very much like, uh, especially in Split and along the coast. And then when it's the summer, well, how, why not head inland? You know, you can, still, you can still have your coastal moments and be on the islands and stuff. But when it is packed in these areas, which I think is something that's all over the world, um, that you go to these other places where you can still enjoy that quality of life that Croatia has to offer, without having to kind of avoid massive groups of people in the, in the city. Um, so yeah, just wanted to add to that because yeah, Tanya brought up the issues of say Dronic and, and Split and, and Zadara is also developing in that way. Um, so um, yeah, thinking about, you know, how to best manage people in a country almost, getting them moving around. Yeah, I'm very keen on the idea of community and experiences just because even I just did a podcast this morning as well, and we were talking about community building as the thing to attract. And we were talking about Bansko because Bansko is not a well-known destination outside of the digital nomad community. Nobody goes to Bansko or talk about Bansko unless you are in the nomad community and you know about the nomad fest that's held annually there, right? I'll be very keen to talk to uh, Mateus who runs the festival and the co-working space there. Um, that's an interesting topic to look, to look into and I think there's a huge shift towards like communities being the key anchor in drawing people to certain destination. But of course, you need to have the experiences and the infrastructure there to match it up. But, but I do foresee community being a big attraction for remote workers, for sure. Um, so to conclude, I know that there's a lot of exciting things happening uh, in the next few months or into 2022. So why don't you tell us what, uh, what are the new and exciting, exciting things coming up and where can people find more information about DNA and saltwater? Oh, exciting things coming up. I don't know how much I'm allowed to tell you because I'm meant to be exciting and new and you know surprises, but we do have, I hope, and I, I know some things and I hope for other things, but in the first six months of next year, there'll be some things coming up that will keep Croatia relevant. It, you know, um, yeah, I'm not going to tell you too much, but it's all about supporting digital nomads in Croatia. It's all about offering them something new, offering something that isn't offered anywhere else in the world um, that we know yet. It's about having more events to promote some of these locations that we've, we've mentioned today, Osijek, Bielovar. Uh, Paula, Rijeka, like if you know any of those four, you're doing really well in your geography of, of Croatia and your knowledge. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but you can follow everything that DNA Croatia is doing at dnacroatia.com. And DNA Croatia is our handle in uh, for, on Facebook, on Instagram, or on LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn is huge for our DNA Croatia um, activity. And DNA stands for Digital Nomad Association. Yeah, Digital Nomad, uh, Digital Nomad Association. Croatia. That's why it's DNA Croatia. It's too much of a mouthful otherwise. So that's from us. And I know Tanya has a few good things coming too. I do, but they're a secret still. I'm sorry. I would love to share it and I will. Uh, Rex, I promise you a very early exclusive uh, when, when we can announce them. But yeah, some pretty cool stuff. Uh, we won four awards this year. So it's like, woo, the bar is high. It has to be raised higher. I'm um, yeah, I'm uh, putting on the pressure on myself and everyone that I work with for some really standout stuff uh, in 2022. I also need to say, Rax, I love your glasses. 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's the signature. <laughs> Some people think it's virtual, and then they were like, "How does the glasses stick on your face?" Like, but that's physical. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So it's very exciting. I think like the way I see you guys do your work and the the things you guys are doing makes me excited to really follow through and follow on to see like what's going on in different parts of Croatia for sure. Yeah, so we will. Keep in touch. I think I know a bit about what's happening next year, but I'm looking forward to hear. I wouldn't say too much about it, but yes, yes. All right. Thank you guys for coming on today. Thank you, Rex. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Rex. See you.